messages actually so um yeah so welcome welcome to the the, the talk um can someone just confirm that they can see the slides uh that are up there you can see the slides i think it says you can so um <laughs> anybody <laughs> all right slides visible all right let's start uh, so my name is Mike. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm here to present uh, managing transactions on Ethereum with Apache Airflow. Um, currently, I'm just a mining pool operator and a PhD student at Drexel. Um, previously, I was a data architect and data platform engineer, systems engineer, working in data centers. And I've been doing, I've been using Apache Airflow probably for, I don't know, probably since 20, late 2016. Um, to do automation and things. Uh, really got heavy in 2017 and 2018, um, but I still use it today for some of my Ethereum automation. Um, and so that's what I'm here to talk about. Uh, a little bit of background on Ethereum. Those of you who don't know what it is, uh, there are really two ideas. One is Ethereum, another is Ether. They're actually different. So when we'd say Ethereum, we're referring to this public computing platform which is the collection of all of the nodes uh, globally that run the Ethereum software. And uh, the way that you can think about what Ethereum is, is it's a distributed ledger technology, but essentially what it is, it's, it's a state machine. And it every time someone does an Ethereum transaction, they are incrementing the state. So there is a Genesis state and all of the, the sum of all of the transactions create these state changes uh, to give us the current state of the Ethereum platform. Um, what a transaction looks like is it has a, a hash and they are collated into blocks. Uh, this isn't really a blockchain talk, but what is sort of highlighted here is that you can do these uh, token transfers. Uh, so these are tokens on the Ethereum platform that are, that are uh, what are called stable coins. And you can see that this, what's actually happening here, uh, let me see if I can get the pointer. What's actually happening here is one address is sending a transaction to many addresses. So this, this value here is going to many different addresses. And this is kind of what we mean when we say state transition. So the balance of this user has decreased and the balance of this, these accounts has increased. And that's kind of a state transition. Um, another common one are swaps. So on the Ethereum platform, you commonly are swapping one token for another token. This isn't an endorsement of either of these tokens. I literally just pulled this transaction fresh today. I have no idea what these this is. I know this is a stable coin, uh, which is how I found this transaction. Um, but you can see that the, the state transitions are kind of complicated in the sense that here we're going from one to another. We're going through a few accounts to get to the final account. Um, another less understood thing about Ethereum is what is Ether? So I'm sure people have heard of Ethereum and think like that's that thing I can buy on Coinbase. Uh, but Ether is the uh, native currency for the Ethereum platform. And it's how you pay for running uh, code execution on the Ethereum platform. So it's a native currency and all of the, any sort of computation that needs to be done inside of a state transition. For example, uh, you know, summing all of the balances uh, or checking if the balance of a user is above a threshold. Those, those operations, just like normal computer operations, have a, a cost associated with them. Uh, so you can see like state saving data and loading data from the blockchain, from the Ethereum blockchain actually has a cost uh, and it's in these gas units. So you can see that everything that you do, let me just not, not do that, make that go away. Everything that you do on the Ethereum platform incurs a transaction fee, and those transaction fees are what incentivize people to run the Ethereum blockchain software uh, because running it requires resources. Okay, so now I'll shift into what Airflow is. So Airflow is a workflow management system. It's a platform for programmatically authoring, scheduling, and monitoring workflows. 
it's sort of an all-in-one integrated uh, system, provides a way to create workflows, uh, which are called, which are typically referred to as DAGs. Uh, they are directed asynchronous graphs. So these are graphs that don't have any loops in them. They run from end to end with no looping. Um, and then the, within these directed acyclic graphs or workflows, you have various types of operations, which we call operators. Uh, and operators are what actually do the, uh, you know, do the functionality. And each operator is sort of um, parameterized. And when you run a workflow, uh, the operators get executed and we call the execution of the operators uh, tasks. So here are just a couple examples of uh, directed acyclic graph workflows. Uh, on this side, this is an old workflow that I used to do when I was working uh, previously. I actually pulled this from a talk a while ago. And this is the workflow that I'm gonna focus on today, which is what's actually happening here is we are, uh, there are two wallets and what we're doing is we're first checking the balance of a wallet and then we're sending any surplus uh, to another wallet. And then we're confirming that the send was successful and then we're completing it. And we do this, we do this workflow twice for two different wallets. Um, so these workflows, I just wanna flip over here for a second, yeah. So these workflows, uh, Airflow provides this really nice interface. So this goes to the, the point about monitoring workflows. Uh, this, is the same, this is the same workflow we were just looking at, the two wallet check. And what you see is it, for each of the tasks that run in the workflow, this runs every day at midnight. Actually, it runs every day at, at uh, right before midnight, an hour before midnight. Um, and you can see each of the little green squares here are the task instances for a specific workflow execution. So some of the core ideas of Apache Airflow that we have to go over before we get to the example are some of the words I just said, which is DAGs, operators, hooks, and task instances. So again, when we talk about a DAG, what we're talking about is a workflow. Uh, and the example that we're going to continue to use is the balance check, the two wallet balance check. Um, all of the workflows that you create are written in Python code. And the, the workflows, each workflow is stored in a single Python file. And so I have sort of an example of my workflows. I have one, two, three, four, five workflows here. Uh, these are pool related uh, activities for managing transactions. And uh, each one is a single Python file. Um, and each file should essentially be one workflow. The next little bit is the operators. So operators describe a single task in a workflow. They are sort of map to, uh, you know, specific, specific execution. So you have like a Python operator and an SFTP operator and MySQL operator. And those things essentially, they either run queries or they execute Python code or they, you know, transfer files. Um, there is also a uh, final type of operator, which we refer to as a sensor. It's a specific type of operator that actually does a, it kind of does like a waiting, you know, it'll sort of loop until uh, something happens and then it will, it will return successfully and the, ex the workflow can continue after that. There is also cross communication in the workflows or in the operators. There is uh, Apache Airflow has a feature called XCOM. Uh, which I actually make a lot of use of, even though I think the, it's kind of, you know, a lesser known uh, feature, lesser used feature, but you can sort of cross communicate between workflows, which I have some examples of. The next idea, so operators are essentially, uh, you know, these are, these are steps in the workflow, but within the operators, there are what are called hooks and the hooks are essentially integrations to other services. So up top, what I have is this is an old operator that I created, which was MySQL to Google Cloud Storage, basically runs a query on MySQL, takes the result and saves it in Google Cloud Storage. And this operator, this single operator actually consists of two hooks. So there's one hook into connecting to MySQL, and then there's another hook into connecting to Google Storage. And the hooks are essentially reusable across other operators. Um, the, the operators that I created for this Ethereum use case are shown down below. 
there are two operators or two there's one operator and two hooks that make up that operator so the first hook is what's called a web3 hook which connects to the ethereum blockchain to execute code and then there is a uh, ethereum wallet hook which really just connects locally to retrieve the private key for a wallet um, all of the wallets on ethereum are backed by public private key cryptography so this is just an integration to get that private key safely um, finally there's this idea of tasks and task instances like i was sort of saying before when a when a workflow executes or a dag executes the operators they get executed with parameters and those uh, operator executed with parameters are referred to as a task. So all these little green dots you see over here, these are all tasks. You can sort of see that, uh, you know, they, they each sort of run independently and they can fail and they can prevent other tasks from running. That's sort of the directed acyclic graph nature of it. Um, and yeah, so once they, this gives you a really good monitoring feature because you can see what, what exactly in the workflow failed and you can, you know, mitigate it after that. Um, another important thing is Airflow gives you uh, centralized monitoring, alerting, and logging. Uh, one of the really important things about this Ethereum-based uh, activity is per, if you're going to automate lots of transactions on Ethereum, you definitely don't want to have instances where you're double spending, or not double spending, you're, essentially you're paying someone twice or you're transferring more than you wanted to. Um, so monitoring and alerting is pretty critical for that. The other uh, equally bad instance uh, if not actually worse, because it hurts the customer more than double paying them, is uh, if you just don't, if it just fails. So uh, Airflow kind of gives you some features built in to kind of monitor and alert. And also th this is kind of important, which is to retry, because the way that Ethereum works is when you send out a transaction to be executed, sometimes it just doesn't execute because it is a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network and it's kind of crazy what happens on it. So sometimes it fails. And so there's a way to execute, uh, re-execute them. Um, so what I have here is just a view of the logging interface. It is kind of nice. You can, you can from, the, uh, from each of the workflows, you can just sort of get a log and you can scroll right through it. So when something fails, you don't have to go digging around log files. It essentially provides a user interface for that, which is really helpful. So, all right, so that's all about Airflow. Now what I want to talk about and walk people through, and this is going to be very technical, is a very specific example of using Apache Airflow in production to do something on Ethereum. And the thing that we're doing on Ethereum is we are just transferring uh, Ethereum from two wallets to uh, one central wallet. So this is a really common use case, uh, which is you, know, you have many wallets doing many different things. And on a periodic basis, you wanna check the balance. If there's anything surplus, bring it back to the central wallet. Uh, you could think of, you know, maybe an exchange that wants to do this. I do this because I have wallets that accumulate Ethereum and I want to bring all that Ethereum back on a periodic basis. So you sort of see uh, before the workflow gets executed, we have two wallets that have some Ethereum in them. And then after the, get, after the workflow gets executed, we have one wallet that has all of the Ethereum, all right? So the way that this sort of works, this is the same workflow I was showing earlier. It's a three, three steps and we do it twice. The first step is we check the balance of the wallet to see if there's any surplus. And then after we check the wallet and find surplus, we then send the surplus. And then after we send the surplus, we actually have to wait for that transaction to be confirmed by the network. These transactions could take they could take a very long time. It could take several days, um, depending on the conditions of the network. It's sort of a peer-to-peer -peer thing, so you kind of have to wait for it. Um, and then once both of these finish, then we just essentially say that we're done, and you know the done job just really uh, marks everything as successful. Um, in the code, in the in the Python code for this uh, workflow, you essentially have three operators that get executed. The first is a Python operator, which just executes some Python code. And then the second two operators are some reusable operators that I created, which are the Ethereum send ERC20 operator, which actually sends tokens or sends Ethereum. And then we have an Ethereum transaction confirmation sensor, which is a type of operator, like I said earlier, that senses whether something has happened. And then after the sensing is confirmed, after it, you know, after it senses that that happens, then it just continues. 
So you can see both of these workflows, they basically have the sensor built in so that after we send the transaction, we have to wait for it to be confirmed. And then after it's confirmed, then we can say that we're done. And both of these, because of the way that this is set up, both of these have to complete in order for this to complete successfully. If one of these branches fails, then this also this job will also fail, sort of a downstream failure. So you can see the directed acyclic graph nature sort of creates these dependencies. So, and this is just one of the branches. So there's actually, this code gets repeated again uh, with like two, and then you have your second branch. So let's start by looking at the Python operator piece. So this is what a Python operator essentially looks like. The way that the Python operator works is, and this is probably the basic thing that you can do in Apache Airflow, which is you can just do everything in Python operators. You don't need to use any of the other operators. You can just wrap some Python code in a Python operator and execute it. The simplest job would just be like a one step a workflow that's just executing some Python code and that kind of functions as cron. Um, but what you can see is essentially up here with the check balance, what we're doing is we're passing that check balance in as a Python callable to the Python operator. And that Python operator is gonna get called by the Airflow scheduler and it will execute this Python code. The other thing you'll notice is that we can actually sort of parameterize it. So in the setup, uh, this function is written once, but it's executed many times. We have check one, check two, check three, as many checks as we want. Um, and each time we can specify a specific address that we want to check um, using this you know, arguments passing method. So you can sort of see the context here uh, gives us a way to, to key into the dictionary down here to get the address. All right, so that's the Python operator. The next operator is the send operator. So we send the ERC20 token operator. Um, the, way, the way that this kind of works, this, like I said, this operator is custom. So I'm gonna have to walk through how it was constructed as sort of an example. Um, it's consisting of three components. We have the connection, we have the hook, which connects us to the Ethereum blockchain. And then we have the other hook, which connects us to the wallet, which you can think of the wallet as just a username and password. It's a public and private key. So let's look at the Ethereum wallet hook part first. The other nice thing about Apache Airflow is it gives you a user interface for managing connections and secrets for connections. And in your hooks, you can actually go in and grab that connection information. So if you look, this, this wallet hook is actually really simple. All it's doing is actually on the, uh, on itself, it's just setting two properties. It's setting its public key to be equal to the connection login, which is this value here. And it's setting the private key to be the connection password, which is this value down here. So we set both of the key, the, the public key and the password. And the nice thing about this is we don't need to, you know, code our path. We don't need to put our private key somewhere. There's already a safe place for us to put it, which is encrypted and saved. Like all passwords should be saved uh, in a database for ourselves, which is much better than, you know, maybe putting it in a, a file and loading up, but not as good as some other things. There's some other ways to secure them. So. All right. So let's look at the other side of it, which is the, the connection to the Ethereum blockchain. So the connection to the Ethereum blockchain, we use, we use the same connections interface where we basically, oh, we, we have the same connections, sorry, my mouse is like freaking out. We have the same connection interface where we create these connections and we specify some information about the connection. In this case, the secret here, these are API keys. Um, so they're a little, not quite as secret as the private keys. So we can just put them in this, uh, you know, this extras field. There's also not kind of a clear place up here where it would put it like the private key, it's obviously the login and password. That makes, that's a good parallel. But down here, the X, these are basically, uh, you know, endpoints with, with API keys. So we sort of wrap them in here. Um, and then the way that works is it's a very similar structure. All we're doing here, we're doing one extra step. We first set two properties, right? So we set the HTTP endpoint and we set the uh, WebSockets endpoint. And then what we do is we import a Python package called Web3 which is a Python package that supports interfacing with the Ethereum blockchain clients over RPC connection. And what we do is we just initialize instances of those connections. So we initialize a Web3 connection 
for the WebSocket, and we can initialize a Web3 connection with the HTTP provider. All right, so that's the two integration points. And then what we have is we have the actual operator that does the work. So this is a little messy. We'll, walk, we'll sort of walk through it step by step. Um, the first part of this is actually, there's sort of two, two parts to this, but when you create an operator, as you kind of saw with the Python operator, there are all of these properties, these sort of reusable properties that you can initialize. So you see, we specify things like the contract address, the, the pool wallet address, and we also specify which Ethereum wallet we want to use. So this is saying the wallet we created earlier was called pool wallet one. So we're going to create pool wallet one. And the other uh, connection that we want to use is our inferior connection. And what happens is, is the first step of all of the operators is essentially just to initialize all the properties that are going to get used later. The next step of all operators is they all have a execute function. So this is sort of the, the pattern, the design pattern in Airflow is you inherit from the base operator. The base operator gives you all sorts of uh, functionality, but the idea is that you're going to override the execute method in the base operator. The base operator doesn't implement an execute method. You have to implement the execute method. So all of the Python code that goes to executing this transaction uh, or doing whatever the operator is going to be designed to do, all of that goes in the execute function uh, here, and you're overriding, or you're essentially implementing, but it's really kind of an over, it's an override. Um, you're overriding something that just raises an exception. But anyway, you put all the code that you want in here. Um, so if you remember earlier, what I was saying was you use hooks to sort of do the integration, and then the operator implements those hooks. So if you notice here, we are importing the two hooks uh, that we use. Um, the code actually, if you look at the line numbers, this bit of code is not in this. This is one file. And then this little bit of code is actually what you saw earlier, uh, just expanded. So th these are all one file. If you sort of see it's 20, line 29 continues up here, line 29. So we import the hooks that we created earlier and this time around, all we do is we're not, we're not rewriting the code to initialize our Web3 connection, and we're not rewriting the code to get the Ethereum wallet address. We're just in initializing instances of the hooks. And then that gives us an ability to get some of the information about the hooks later and use the, um, the, the objects that are created inside the hooks. So the two objects that we create from the hooks, one is the Web3 connection object, which lets us interface with Ethereum. The other object is the wallet address or the wallet object, which has a public, addre a public address and a private key. And if you see what we're doing here is we're actually creating the transaction for the Ethereum blockchain to be executed. We are signing that transaction with our private key to indicate that it's ready to be executed or that to indicate that we can execute it. We are signing our own transaction. Um, and then down below, we actually broadcast the transaction out to the blockchain. So the last little bit here is the send confirmation. So after we broadcast it out, we want to confirm that it was sent. And this is where we use the, the pattern called a sensor. So sensors are just subsets of operators. They, a sensor is an operator. Um, it's just a special implementation of an operator. Um, so here is the, the confirmation sensor operator code. It inherits from the base sensor operator. And the base sensor operator has an execute function that looks a lot like this, where it basically says, in the execution, while the, the poke uh, method does not return true, so while poke returns false, we're just gonna keep looping and try it again later. So it's appropriately named, there is a poke function. And what the poke function is responsible for doing in a sensor is it either returns true or false, depending on whether or not the sensor has sensed what it is looking for. In this case, what we're sensing is, we're sensing whether the transaction was confirmed. The way that this works is we actually pick up the transaction from the XCOM, which is sort of a shared uh, memory location within Airflow that you can put data. 
And we specifically are getting the transaction hash from the previous step. And then what we do is we actually are just here, we're just sort of checking the transaction to see if it's been executed. Uh, we're seeing how many confirmations there are. Uh, if, it, if there are errors, then we basically say there are no confirmations. Um, transaction not found being the primary exception that's happening. Um, and then what we do is at the bottom, if you let the thing go away, is we just make sure that there are more confirmations than our threshold. Usually you, you could use one as a threshold, but two, I usually use two as a threshold. Um, so you can wait until two confirmations on the blockchain, which means two blocks have been added on top of your, your execution. Um, and that will sort of allow you to know that the transaction has been completed. Okay. All right. So here's the poke function and the poke function returns a true false statement. Uh, and then in the execute function of the operator, it's just basically checking while the poke has not returned true, just keep executing and check back on it later. Um, so I, you know, one of the things I always end with as I kind of wrap up here is there are other alternatives for workflow management and kind of execution. So, you know, some of them, NiFi, Beam, uh, Spotify has a project called Luigi. Um, these are really good projects. The thing about Airflow is it's not streaming. So in my work case, my use case here, it wasn't really, you know, these aren't, I don't need a, like a fire, I'm not reading data out of a fire hose here. I'm just doing workflows. Um, I'm not executing a lot of workflows either. I mean, I'm doing maybe like five or six transactions a day or something like not even that many transactions. Um, but so, so the, the use case for airflow is actually a little bit better here. You wouldn't want to, if I was doing the reverse, which was kind of monitoring the Ethereum blockchain and waiting for something to happen and then kicking off some work, then a better use, a better tool might be one of these streaming solutions. Um, but as far as workflow management, where I'm just executing, essentially I'm just executing code on a cron job. Uh, this is the Airflow, which just gives you like one level, a much better level of you know monitoring, alerting, uh, code management than it would be if you did cron job. And I've seen a lot of cron job, uh, and you know this is it, it, it as easy as it is to set up a cron job. You can just set up Airflow with one, uh, you know, one task or one one operator. So. Um, the other thing is for, for, uh, for airflow specifically, the, the main thing that always sells me on it is that one, I'm just really comfortable with airflows, uh, programming model. I found I've explored beam beam. I explored pretty in depth. I just, the, the programming model to me just never really clicked. And so I, as, as much as I wanted to use it, I never really picked it up because I found the programming model just a little different. I mean, it works, it's great, but. Um, the programming model I understand for Airflow really well, which is why I tend to gravitate towards it. Um, and then the other thing about Airflow is it, the Python, it, you can pretty much wrap any Python code in an operator. Um, so that's really helpful. It's super easy if you already have existing Python code. It's really easy to just wrap it up and, and deploy it and monitor it with Airflow. Um, the other thing for IT stakeholders, I mean, they may, yeah, they may, there, there's a couple selling points, which is that you can basically integrate any system that with Python, like anything that you can integrate with Python, you can wrap into the Airflow programming model and kind of get this um, get this workflow. Um, the other thing is sort of automate deployment of workflows. If you have, I used to do a lot of this where you have, you know, once I have a, a workflow, I might have to do that same workflow many times with different parameters. And Airflow makes it really nice and easy to sort of convert to build Airflows or to build workflows using like YAML files. Um, just because it is Python code, you can kind of dynamically render a uh, workflow. Um, and then of course the centralized monitoring and alerting uh, is also a huge added benefit, something that really gets missed uh, a lot. So um, so yeah, that, that's, that, that's the talk here. So I appreciate everyone uh, coming and looking. I, I know we have, we have, I tried to leave some time because I'm sure people might have questions about specific parts. So let me just flip over. Now I can see the chat. So let me see. All right. How do you ensure idiom potency of the workflow? Yeah. So it's really on you to do that. Uh, like the way that I do it is essentially, usually it's just putting things into a database and checking that things didn't happen. There isn't any controls or protections that Airflow gives you. It's really your responsibility to do it. It's a design requirement when you make a workflow to make sure that they're item potent. Um, you know, one way to do it would essentially just be that 
you know, check for failures. And then if there are failures, log them. I have a, I have a workflow where essentially it, it sends transact, it sends Ethereum to miners. And part of that workflow is it will actually, uh, it'll actually just check ahead of time. If the record has already been marked as paid, then don't send it again. So it's basically a sensor in the beginning that just says like, has this already been executed? If it hasn't, then don't execute it. Um, and in those cases, when I check the uh, the sensor, the sensor is essentially it, it it won't come back as a failure. It just if it if it doesn't sense that it's executed, it just hangs, and someone has to manually intervene. Um, and then there are a few command line tools that give you like a a way to kind of manually rerun specific tasks. And if you set up Airflow correctly, you can actually rerun specific tasks through the interface. Um, it just depends on how you set it up. You have to use like a, uh, a, a an executor like Celery or Kubernetes, and then you can kind of cl click to rerun tasks. Yeah, are there any other questions? That was a, that's always a really good question, which is how do you confirm the idiopotency of the tran of the transaction? It's really on you as the engineer doing as the designer to you know track things and make sure that you're not rerunning them. I do it in a database. I have a Postgres database where I keep a lot of the results for this. So the workflow that I just did, if it fails, it doesn't, because it's doing the check balance in the beginning, that workflow doesn't have any instances where it might double spend. Uh, because what it'll do is it'll, if the first workflow flows through and, and we, and it gets rerun again by accident, it'll just see that the check balance is uh, already been, it's, it, it doesn't meet the threshold to trigger a payment uh, or to trigger a transaction. But as far as the jobs that I have that send from a you know a large wallet, it's sending small transactions to individuals. Those those transactions get recorded into a database, and the first step in the flow is to check and confirm that there isn't already a transaction that's been sent. Um, and they also have failure modes such that if they fail, they're not going to just retry um, until somebody has come and checked it. It's sort of a it's sort of a managed by exception where if it fails, it's not going to retry itself automatically because there's a risk that it might. Uh, double spend. So, yeah. So I use both. Actually, I use I use time based scheduling for most of the workflows. However, uh, there are uh, there is a Airflow API, and so I have I have one or two workflows that get triggered on a API API call. So if another system essentially calls to Airflow and says, "Trigger this work trigger this workflow with these properties." And that executes it. And I also have another workflow that there's a common a common pattern is uh, doing essentially a workflow that can, can that can trigger n number of tasks. So it's kind of like a fan out, and you don't know how many tasks it's going to run at that time. For that, you actually have to use kind of event based triggering, and you have to have two flows. So if you have one work one workflow, essentially triggers the other workflow n number of times, depending on what the work first workflow. So the use case for that would be, I'm going to query my database and I'm going to see there are 10 payments that need to execute. So the last work part of my workflow is going to be to kick off 10 more workflows of another type. Um, and actually in the slides here, let me see, that's actually what's happening in, uh, these two workflows down, I don't know where to go. Two of these workflows, let me see if I can find the dashboard. No, maybe I, I didn't show the dashboard because I have a bunch of stuff on it, but basically two of the workflows, what I have going on is one triggers uh, a whole bunch of the other ones. Um, let me just click back and put that. So. All right, that's a good question. Thank you. Other questions? Anyone else have any other questions or anything? So we have like an extra five minutes. Um, I'm not sure. I'll stick around for more questions. Uh, you know, I didn't want to, I kind of thought people would have a bunch of questions about this. Um,
are you triggering any jobs based on touch files? Um, does that mean like if a file exists? Is that what you're asking? Am I triggering any jobs based on touched files? I think uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the interpretation would be if a file changes, trigger a workflow. Um, I've done something similar to that with SFTP, and it wasn't necessarily the the touch wasn't what triggered the workflow. The the trigger was an, a a time based trigger. It was a uh, just a, uh, every you know I think it was like every three hours it would check. And if the file existed on the SFTP server, then it would pull the file in. Um, and that was a that's that I've, that pattern I've done a lot actually to pull some kind of server when a file exists, uh, pull it in, you know, put it in the database. So and that's kind of the difference between sort of a streaming workflow where maybe you could set up you know a stream that looks at a file. Uh, or looks at a directory or something. Uh, so I'm not sure why this isn't loaded back up. Yeah, good question. I, I think that, I hope that was what you were asking about touch, touch files. Other questions? Yeah, thanks, thanks. All right, so if there are no questions, I mean, I'll hang out for another couple of minutes um, and, uh, and then I'm gonna take off. So go see the next talks. And out DAGs versus automatic DAG generation. Yeah, I actually, you know, my, the automatic DAG generation, you can't generate a DAG that has a dynamic number of tasks. The, the number of tasks has to be determinate. So if dynamically, the question is, what are your thoughts on fan out DAGs versus DAG generation? What has to happen if you wanna do a fan out that is not a fixed number? So like one thing is I have the fan out, I have a fan in uh, at the top. So most of everything that you've seen is fan out, um, right? So here's sort of a, here's kind of a fan out where we go to two steps and then fan out again to two steps, fan out again to two steps. And then at the end, it's a fan in. With these two steps here, the, these steps are determinant in the code. So in the code, there is a, there is, it's actually in a YAML file that defines this, but it's not like we're dynamically saying that, you know, there's going to be two or there's going to be one. The DAG here has to be fixed. So what you really have to do is you actually have to create two DAGs. Oh, sorry, I keep quoting this. Um, you have to actually create two DAGs. One DAG triggers the other DAG n number of times. So I do this a few times. Um, I don't really have an example. I thought it might be a little complicated, but essentially what happens is it queries a database and it can return n number of records. And then for each record, we need to do something. And so for that, what has to happen is you have to execute another DAG. And there is actually a trigger DAG uh, operator. So you can, the last operator that you have can trigger any, a number of DAGs. So that's usually the pattern that I operate under is if you have to fan out and do an, an indeterminate number of workflows, those are separate workflows and you trigger them from another DAG with the distinct properties. So if you imagine that database record, you have 10, you return 10 records, you take the properties of the first record, you pass that into another DAG execution, and then the second record, pass that into another DAG execution. Um, and that's the that's actually a common pattern that I, I use in Airflow to solve that and number problems. So it's really advanced and tricky to figure out. So if you wanna get in touch with me, I can kind of walk you through it. But once you figure it out, it's actually, it's really helpful. Um, the other question, do you split the source code for the DAG construction from the DAG folder? I don't actually. Uh, typically my DAG will construct itself if it's a dynamically constructed one. Like if I'm building a DAG based on the contents of a YAML file, um, I will just keep that, that will just be part of the DAG. And then the YAML code, I will just have that within my DAG's directory um, under in a folder typically called like config or something. 
Um, so I don't split the source code for DAG construction. But then again, I'm not doing so, so such sophisticated DAG construction. Most of my DAG construction is just Python files, maybe 100, 100 lines, 200 lines uh, or less. And they're maybe doing like, you know, just a few steps. So, but yeah, I know, I know there are a lot of the Airflow deployments that have far more sophisticated uh, DAG construction uh, code. And for those, I could imagine they would probably split that out. Uh, I, in a previous Airflow talk I did, I actually had a slide that would show that, but basically what they do is they'll have a system that produces the DAGs and then those DAGs get produced and put into a folder on the Airflow servers. Um, so they have two separate code bases. They have the DAG code base and then they have the code base where they are producing the DAGs. So. All right, so thanks for the questions. I appreciate it. Um, I hope everyone found it useful. Uh, I will, uh, I will, uh, I mean, I don't know if I close, I'm gonna close my screen share, um, but I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna go to the next talk. So thanks for, thanks for watching.